And the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Galatia to tell them that there are sometimes ways and roads that you should not enter. There are wrong ways. In fact, what Paul addresses the Galatians with is false teaching. Now, false teaching isn't a very common phrase today, is it? It's not something that we hear very often, false teaching. And I think one of the reasons for that is that in the world in which we live today, oftentimes we have elevated opinion to the level of truth. We've elevated opinions to the level of truth. In other words, whatever my opinion is, that's truth for me. And whatever your opinion is, that's truth for you. Well, the truth is that theologians of old, as well as even the classical philosophers who were searching for the truth, even they realized how bankrupt that way of thinking is. Why? Because if truth is only a matter of opinion, they said, then even, even the most evil of opinions could be truth. The most vilest of viewpoints could be truth. I could hold a very racist view, and that's truth for me. No. There has to be truth. And the Apostle Paul pointed out to the Galatians the importance of following that truth, of discovering that truth for their life, and of allowing that truth to lead them forward. So how do we discern that? How do we discern the truth for our lives and for those that we love? That's really what the Apostle Paul is saying. And so we'll break it down together briefly today. First of all, any word or way that leads you to desert rather than convert, do not enter. Do not enter. The Apostle Paul said it, we read it together. I am amazed that you are so soon deserting, deserting the one who called you through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the Galatians had started off with a strong commitment. They had received what the Apostle Paul had come, come to offer. But many of them had started to desert the ranks. That is, they had allowed a commitment that was once strong to become eroded. And some of them thought that that was okay. Any word that leads you to desert, rather than to keep your conversion and commitment to Christ as strong, do not enter. Maybe it's just me, but I have a feeling many of you observe this. In our culture today, it is easy to fall prey to the erosion of commitment. The erosion of commitment. What started out as sort of a family legacy for many people, a strong commitment to Christ and His way over time, generation after generation, it slowly begins to erode. Perhaps even in your own faith journey, you have gone through seasons where that commitment has eroded away. We know erosion in the natural world, yes. Erosion, trees are cut, heavy rains come, the topsoil washes off, the bank begins to give away some. More rains come, the soil shifts some more, and slowly but surely, everything erodes away. I had a forester friend who served in the Golly Ranger District, and he said this one time, the problem with erosion is that by the time you recognize it, the damage is already done. By the time you recognize it, the damage is already done. That's what happens when it comes to our commitments eroding away. At first, we don't really notice it. We don't notice that some of the decisions that we've made have led us away from Christ instead of to Christ. We don't notice that some of the viewpoints that we have or practices we have are leading us in the wrong direction. And we slowly allow our commitment to erode. The Apostle Paul says the way to discover truth is to keep your commitment to Jesus Christ strong. You were converted to Christ, he says. You came to know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And being converted to Christ, by the way, is not a one-time event. It is a daily event. Every day, we keep putting ourselves under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to keep our conversion and our commitment strong. One decision at a time. You know, this is Labor Day weekend, and one of the most labor-intensive 
things I remember from my teen years is when my parents decided to build onto our home. And my dad had this vision of having a field stone fireplace. And of course, the boys were pressed into service because he didn't just go out and get the field stone. We went up the holla to the farm and we picked the stones up out of the field. They literally were the field stones. And we put them in the back of the truck and we hauled them back. We dumped them in our yard. We had this huge stack of field stone. I, I couldn't see it. I said, Dad, how is these bunch of rocks going to help build this chimney? And he said, just wait, just wait. And there was a gentleman who helped my father, and they built it together. But you see, I was impatient in my teen years. I wanted to see the whole thing. I had trouble seeing it. I wanted it to be built right away, day after day of mixing mortar and watching them place the stones and get them just right and together. I wanted the whole thing. And finally, the gentleman that was helping my dad said to me, son, you have to realize this project. It is one stone at a time. You put that stone in place and secure it. Then I fit another one in place and I secure it. And one stone at a time, it will come together. And you know what? He was right. He was the expert. He was correct to this day. If you go to my mother's house, you'll see the field stone fireplace that was built there. One stone at a time. Friends, when it comes to keeping our commitment strong, each day, one decision at a time, One rock-solid decision each day for Christ Jesus keeps us pointed in the direction of His truth. Yes, would we like to all think we've arrived and we've progressed and we've grown to everywhere we need to be in our Christian faith, perhaps, but it's still one day, one decision, one commitment at a time in the direction of Jesus Christ. Then our conversion, our commitment will stay strong any word or way that would lead you to desert rather than convert, do not enter. Keep that commitment to Christ strong. Secondly, any word or way that would lead you to twist rather than to turn completely in the direction of Christ, do not enter. We read that verse together as well. There are many among you who would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, in the Greek language, that word pervert literally means to twist. You see, that's what was happening in the Galatian church. False teachers were coming around. They were saying, you know, I know what the Apostle Paul told you about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and that it's by grace alone that you come into a relationship with God. And you know, Paul's okay, but you need some of these other things too. Let let us tell you about these other things. And they began to slowly twist the message that Paul had offered. That's what he was challenging them with. Some of them are twisting the gospel of our Lord. It's not a twist, my friends. It's a turn. A turn completely in the direction of Christ. Because when we twist, when we choose only to twist, uh, we get into trouble. Let me use this example. I hope I'm not the only one to whom this has happened. Driving down the interstate highway, I want to change lanes. So instead of doing what I should, I just kind of twist over and look out my side view mirror. Looks clear to me. I just twist over, look out the side view mirror, and start to move, only to find out all of a sudden there's a horn. Someone's reminding me they're in the lane. I didn't see them. I know from my parents' instruction, instead of just twisting and looking the side view, I need to turn. I need to turn and make sure, because why? If I only twist, it leaves too many blind spots. You've probably encountered the blind spot in your mirror. It leaves too many blind spots if we just twist. And friends, that's the way it is in our spiritual lives. When it comes to learning and leaning on the truth of Jesus Christ, a little twist won't do. We need to turn completely in the direction of our Lord and Savior who offered Himself for us. We need to turn ourselves completely over to the one who is truth for our life. He knows the truth of your life because he created you. He knows why you were created, the purpose, and all of the things associated with that truth. So why would I try to twist that around or get by with just a little instead of turning completely, turning completely in his direction? I have to tell you something. It's one of the fears that I have in my ministry. And the Apostle Paul dealt with that. That's why he was so strong in repeating that one verse. 
You say, why, Ken? What are you afraid of? I say, I have this fear sometimes that the people whom I'm called to serve will get to the end of their journey and they'll stand before the Lord and they'll say, Lord, no one ever told us that we were supposed to turn completely in the direction of Christ. Everybody around me just thought a little bit, a little twist here and there would do. No one ever said you need to turn your life completely in the direction of Christ. I thought, some of those people, could they have been sitting under my ministry? I hope not. So I say this morning, friends, we turn our lives completely in the direction of Christ is where we discover the truth for our life. And that truth will light your path. It will show you the way even when you're in the darkest moments of your life. Any word or way that would encourage you to just twist instead of turn completely to Christ. Do not enter. Be one that turns your life completely over. Completely over to Christ. Finally, any word or way that would lead you to profess and not practice Christ-like living, do not enter. Any word or way that would say to you, oh, just, you know, give God the lip service. Go through the motions. Profess it with your lips, but don't practice it in your life. Do not enter. Friends, truth that is not practiced truth is inconsequential at every level. It means nothing if it's not practiced. We, we pro- proclaim and profess the truth here in the walls of this sanctuary. But the real difference that that truth makes is outside the walls of this sanctuary as we live our lives in service to Jesus Christ. That's what's going to make the difference. That's why Paul said there in Galatians, I am a servant of Christ. I'm not here to please people. I'm here to please God. It's about practicing the faith for the one who gave himself for us. You know, when I was in college, I remember a story because it made such an impression on me. I always wondered the the end of this story. I don't know. I have to look it up now. But there was a seven-year-old boy named Scott McKenzie. This is in the 80s. And it, na- national headlines at the time, because this little boy, they were on the play, he was on the playground with his uh, four, three-year-old sister and four-year-old playmate, and a dog came loose and attack, was attacking them. But he quickly sheltered the three-year-old and the four-year-old and helped them to climb the jungle gym out of reach of the rabid dog. But he was unable to reach safety himself, and so he himself was attacked before others could bring the dog off of him. And he faced a series of many, many surgeries after that. Now, the reason I remember that is not just because it was striking, but throughout the nation, people used that as an example of of sacrifice. How wonderful it was that a seven-year-old boy would sacrifice himself and see to safety someone else. And it's true, that's true, a great example of sacrifice. But a friend of mine had a really good insight at the time afterwards. He said, you know, they talk about sacrificing for others. He goes, maybe that's part of the problem in the church. Because a lot of church people, given that same scenario, we'd be standing on the jungle gym yelling out, run for your lives! We'd be standing in the safety of the jungle gym saying, over here! Instead of getting down out in the field and helping and sacrificing in a practical way. See, that's what happens sometimes when we profess and don't practice. We yell forth from the church, Come here! Here's the way! And Jesus is saying, Go into the world and practice the faith. That's where the difference will be made. You know, I grew up in somewhat of a revival tradition, and I can remember as a youngster, some of the preachers, when everybody gathered for the service, they said, Now, how many people here are glad that they're saved? Just raise your hand if you're glad you're saved. Of course, everybody's going to raise their hand, right? There's nobody going to leave their hand down at that point. We're all raising our hand. But I don't remember 
And then and, and that's good. I, I was glad for that. But I don't remember when it hit me, probably in my teen years. It, uh, the thought occurred to me one time. Instead of just people in church raising a hand and glad that they're saved, if every single person took that hand and went out into the world and lifted someone up with it, what a different world it would be. If every single person that was raising their hands said, oh, I'm so glad that they would go out and extend that hand to someone else and practice the faith, what a difference it would make. Friends, any word or way that would lead you to profess and not practice Christ-like living Do not enter. God's desire for our life is truth. Truth that leads us to genuine joy and true purpose. Truth that can light us even in the valley of the shadow of death. Friends, that comes, that comes to us if we keep our commitment strong, if we turn completely in the direction of Christ, and if we practice our faith daily. May God give us the wisdom to hear and the courage to follow. Thanks be to God.